Hello, thank you all for coming. This is a session on investigative journalism, how technology has empowered it, which um, is uh, hosted by the Google DNI Fund. Um, just to introduce everybody that is here on this panel, if I start uh, on my far left, uh, we have um, Alison Gao, who is from the UK and is the innovation editor for Trinity Mirror, which is the UK's largest newspaper group, and obviously more than newspapers these days. Um, then we have uh, Stefan Candia, who is the founder of the European Investigative Collaborations Organisations. I have Pavla next to me, who is from the Centre for Investigative Journalism in the Czech Republic. And to my right, my colleague on the DNI Fund, Ludovic Blicher, who um, prior to, to that was also the digital champion at La Liberation, and uh, a fellow at the uh, Newman. So we're going to kick off this morning, if it's okay with you, with uh, a brief introduction about uh, the DNI fund and the investigative reporting things that we are funding through that scheme that aren't in the room. And then we're going to uh, go to each of our panelists and they're going to tell us a little bit about the work they do in this field. And then obviously we want to very much open this up to, to you um, take all your questions, um, so please, uh, let's, let's get going. So I'll hand you over to Ludo. Okay, so br very briefly I'm going to introduce the DNA Innovation Fund because I think it's important to give you a glimpse of what we are doing with the fund. Uh, do you all know what is the Digital News Initiative and the DNA Innovation Fund or not? Okay, so let's assume you know, but uh, the, the DNA Innovation Fund is part of a broader initiative broad, um, upon three, built upon three pillars. The one is product, the other one is research and training, and the third one is innovation. Innovation is all about stimulation, and this digital news initiative is Google framework for dialogue with the news ecosystem. Through the innovation pillar, what we are trying to do is to help the news ecosystem to test new ideas, to their taking risk, and to come with projects about innovation. It's not about modernization, it's really about innovation and stimulation. Aim of the fund is again, stimulate the news ecosystem. We've made available 150 million euros over three years for projects that demonstrate new thinking in the practice of digital journalism or that support the development of new business models. Everyone that have idea for news can apply to the fund. The fund is very broad and open. 32 European countries are eligible to apply, and it's open to startup, individuals, journalists, Broadcaster, legacy media, that's very broad and open. It's about having ideas, having projects, be specific, be in depth, and trying to tackle big challenges the news ecosystem is facing. And investigation is one of those. So we are very glad that you're going to talk more about your project. Very briefly, we have three tracks. One is for big ideas that have Assumptions to be tested is the prototype track, up to 50K, and we found 100% of, um, uh, of the amount of funding requested, again, up to 50K. And then we have medium and large project, up to 1 million euro funding, and medium and large are open only to company with at least one journalist on staff. Prototype is open to everyone. Um, we get in 2016 2030 yeah. uh, 2300 <laughs> yeah. application coming from 30 European countries. At the end of the day, we selected last year 250 projects for 51 million euros across 25, uh, 27 European countries. So. There is a lot of traction, we receive a lot of projects, we're having a lot of interaction and discussion with publishers, and at the end of the day, we always make a very tough, earth-breaking uh, decision. So it's important, if you want to apply, to have in mind that 
the application process in itself is an opportunity to step back, build your vision, brainstorm with your team, and have a project that you are proud of. Difference between uh, the two rounds we had last year was in terms of quality. First round, we had a lot of projects, a bit less on round two, but much more that were high, very, very quali qualitative, and much more collaborative project and collaborative effort, and especially uh, for investigation. What we've tried to do is to organize through clusters the type of project we received. And that's very complicated because innovation is by default something new. And no one tried to really organize uh, all the type of projects. So we created some kind of clusters. One is intelligence, data and management and workflow, interface and discovery, social and community, somehow about business model, distribution and circulation. Um, and the two more, I would say, trending category, the one we receive uh, the, m most of the project is about intelligence. It goes to audience development, semantic, analytics. The other one is next journalism. Next journalism is very big and broad. It goes from fact-checking to gamification, that data journalism, robot journalism, audio development, and a uh, new format. Um, and uh, one of these, of course, is investigation. And this is where I, whoops, sorry. <laughs> you made it. <laughs> I made it. This is where I give you the floor to talk more about investigative projects. Um, thank you for the five minute signal. Um, yeah, so we're, we're gonna talk today uh, purely about investigative journalism. Um, this, this quote sort of caught my eye because um, I, I believe this. Uh, without investigative journalism, really, um, the, the whole the whole thing of journalism is probably uh, will fall apart. So, um, I was just very taken with this uh, quote, and I thought I'd like to share it with you. Um, in uh, the work that we've done on the DNI, we've actually had um, now ten. Uh, investigative journalism projects that we're funding. Um, we look forward to receiving more in the next round. Um, I've, I've put there just some details that I just sort of pulled together having a look at them. And one thing that surprised, surprised me, and is perhaps a bit of a talking point for later, is that why are all ten from non-profit organisations? Um, the, the variety of projects, the variety of countries is very broad. Uh, as you can see, they're everywhere from UK... Romania, Italy, Finland, and the Netherlands are interested in investigative journalism. So some of the things that aren't in the room, but you may uh, know a little bit about. Um, anybody here went to the uh, Jeff Jarvis Trump panel at the beginning of the week? Anybody? Yeah, so you'll have seen there um, uh, Ghia from the Italian uh, uh, investigative reporting project. Uh, she spoke uh, a little bit about it there. But their project is mainly, uh, uh, it's called the Mafia Files, which is a catchy title, but is uh, mainly looking at archiving how public, how public money is used and spent in Italy. Um, it's a prototype. That's one of our, our smaller sort of projects, but it's 50,000 euros that uh, they'll be able to explore that issue more deeply. Uh, one from, from my home country, the UK, <coughs> Uh, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, uh, we are supporting. This is actually our biggest uh, award in this area. Um, and they are looking at how to uh, really help local journalists, journalists on the ground and grassroots, to use data in investigative journalism. And so they've only just started work, um, but they, their project is sort of getting underway, and I think it will get a lot of news headlines one to look out for, really. Um, back uh, d over to Romania, and uh, this project from the Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. I love the names of all these investigative things because they're so straightforward. They tell you exactly what they are, don't they? Um, but it's Crime and Corruption Reporting, and uh, these people actually want to find a sort of white label solution to looking into uh, public expenditure and uh, how to uh, follow that through. And finally, um, not quite finally actually, next but finally, um, from the Netherlands, uh, again, follow the money, 
tells you what they're going to do. That organisation's actually been up and running for a while. It's a non-profit um, based in the Netherlands. And they want to uh, develop a sort of gamification, if you like, how to involve their subscribers more. They're mostly subscription-funded, and uh, their, their readers are also the people that take part in their investigations. So how can they provide them with some interesting kind of tools to, in order to do that and to deepen the engagement they have there? Um, and finally, from, from the UK again, um, Bellingcat, which is probably something that most people in this room have heard of. Um, they do a great deal of verification, investigation, um, at, at, in all sorts of uh, places. But this particular thing they're doing at the moment uh, is part of an archive for conflict investigation. Um, and they've created... I won't play it out here because the video's a bit... Uh, but um, if you have a, a look on, on, on YouTube uh, for Bellingcat, you'll find this Syrian archive, which is an absolutely fascinating document, documented um, video about the work they're doing there. So that's it from us. We're going to hand over now to uh, the good people on this panel. Uh, but before we go, we are available after this uh, for any questions. But basically, the deadline for this is the 20th. Um, please do find us out after. All right, I'm going to hand over first to... <clears throat> okay, so I'm not going to talk about uh, Czech Center for Investigative Journalism as the uh, topic was how actually investigative journalists use different digital tools. So I'm going to, to show you, hopefully, yes, uh, I'm going to show you what uh, are my favorites. And there are not many of them. Usually the problem is that actually uh, we as investigative journalists, we are quite often approached by different uh, tech companies who want to help us. But usually um, it doesn't work. Uh, so we actually had to uh, first really strictly define what do we need. And then we were actually able to tell the tech companies what do we need. So, we can split the technical tools we use into three main categories. The first one, we have to deal with security. So, the first tools I would like to mention that I like and that I use, uh, it's encryption. Encryption on your cell phone and encryption of your emails. Even though the emails are kind of old school, still we use them uh, and we encrypt them. So PGP or GNU PG encryption is a combination with uh, Thunderbird. It's my favorite on a cell phone. We use Signal as it had proven to be the best one so far. Uh, then the second category I'm going to show you a little bit more are actually how we deal with the big chunks of data because sometimes we've got like hundreds of pages of hard copies. Imagine that someone leaks you a hard copy court folder of 800 pages and you have no idea what's in it. The names, uh, and you are not ready to read it. You don't have a time to do it. So what we have and what is like really great tool, it's for free and it's online, is actually investigative dashboard with a new feature that actually keeps me, uh, keeps my discipline on. And that is that uh, you've got six different pillars of this investigative dashboard and actually my favorite is search your stuff. You can upload the scans that are not indexed uh, to this platform and you can keep the documents indexed. You can search them afterwards. You can find the keywords and you can actually match it against <laughs> other company records that are already there or you can match it against different names and you will see which other investigative journalists already worked or covered this issue and you can actually check with them uh, what did they find, if can you use what did they find. And uh, the best feature, I'm not sure if Fred is here. Yeah, he is. I'm not sure if it is. He's the developer, so actually I'm just doing PR of investigative dashboard. <laughs> it's um, entity extraction, what means even if you will upload 800 pages, if you give you, it will give you the names of the entities that are there. Is it already on or are you, Fred, still developing it? 
it's on. So, okay, people, go upload, and then you, you will have a great tool how to search your own documents. Apart from searching your own documents, you have access to, to a lot of love, a lot of love. Business registries data, what means company ownerships, uh, different scans of uh, such a things as are, for example, um, gazettes, business gazettes, what means those are the data that you can't find online because they are only offline. Someone <coughs> took the job, scan it, so you can now search it. Uh, and you can get a different chunks of data, you can search different land registries. So that's it. That's what we we are using, and that's what we need. Then what we else for, what we also use for communication, and I'm using one of my project, is a talk. It's kind of a simplified Slack, and I like it more because once again, it keeps me more focused on the things I'm doing. I can invite other people to create the channels. I can check what did they discover. I can assign them tasks, and so on. And actually the last one, and that's usually the problem, is that tech companies, they are often coming to us that they will give us a tool that will analyze the links between different entities, including phone calls, including uh, business, including family relations, that we just need to give them the data in Excel and then we will see the links. But actually that's, that's not the way it works for me because I need to be able to stand for my investigation. What means I need to be able to go to the court and explain what are the links. And if those links are generated by the machine, I won't be able to explain like, yeah, this is clear because she's a wife of this businessman and if she's actually in a public tender and at the same time a close friend of this businessman, then we can, by circumstantial evidence, say this and this or assume this and this. And actually, if those links are generated by machine, we can't use them. That's why we got this very simple thing we call this, where you can actually draw your uh, draw, draw the links yourself and you will be quite aware what does it mean and you will be able to explain it. Yeah, those were my five minutes. Thank you. So, S Stefan, do you want to tell us a bit about the work of the European Investigative Collaborations that you co-founded? Co uh, thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. So, I wear uh, several hats, and the uh, European Investigative Collaborations is the last uh, um, initiative. It's a, uh, it's a partnership that I started with the Spiegel in Germany. But actually, my initial um, affiliation is the Romanian Center for Investigative Journalism, and uh, I'm working with it. It's a non-profit in Romania for the last 15 years in investigative stories across borders. Mostly it was organized crime at the beginning. And I kind of seen and witnessed um, technology <coughs> developing, um, investigative journalists trying to develop technology or trying to partner up with uh, technologists to develop tools they need for the last 15 years. And it's, it was quite fast, but you think, think about that I started in a newsroom in Romania where there were no computers, there were only uh, typewriters. So <clears throat> it's a really uh, long stretch, uh, long journey. I've been witnessing how uh, data, uh, um, yeah, data exchange yeah, infrastructures uh, have been uh, uh, growing, um, how journalists were using uh, whatever was available um, uh, to buy and then they started to customize some of the stuff where it was possible. And now in the latest years, people do uh, develop their own tools, like you've just seen, in <clears throat> different groups, in different ways, with different uh, architectures, but in a way with the same goal in mind. Uh, you have these two big uh, uh, problems you have to solve, is the um, management of the data that you want to look at in a group, and it's the uh, information exchange that the group has to uh, be communicating fast about findings across different countries and uh, different uh, places where they are located. And that can be a group of five people or it could be a huge uh, group like uh, the ICAJ Panama Papers of hundreds of people. The Ike um, uh, group, it's a bit less than 100 journalists working uh, <clears throat> on different topics in parallel on different stories. The latest one was Football Leaks, and I uh, talked about it yesterday um, more in detail. But what I would uh, like to <clears throat> talk more about now is um, 
while doing this, uh, these tools of, uh, of uh, support for investigative journalism, we, we also realized that um, the way we construct these tools to, to function, this is also the way we kind of shape our um, community of journalists working together. So um, I was starting to look at uh, ways to uh, actually decentralize these uh, tools that we are using for cross-border investigations instead of centralizing them in one place. So it's a bit of a different approach. Uh, I, I, I see the, the needs for having and maintaining a platform where everybody goes and you can just uh, make a good security of that platform and you can uh, administrate that place. I'm trying to do to work now with uh, my colleagues on a, on a different approach where we decentralize this to a point that um, every journalist who, or every person who wants to be part of the project would have a box that would um, have this uh, bundle of tools. And this is actually um, a project that it's one of the projects that has been financed by, um, it's been endorsed by the Innovation Fund, and it's called Liquid Investigations. And the idea is to bundle on an arm board on a small mini computer, uh, these few uh, apps we are using constantly uh, that are growing or already existing apps that have uh, communities of developers behind them. And these are the chat. We use Rocket Chat. We use free software um, uh, to bundle on it. Um, Rocket Chat that does have uh, the OTR for um, encrypted communication, the pads. People are editing in groups on, on pads. The wikis and um, creating the wikis is creating our knowledge base. And we add two things um, that we played with in the last years. We developed our own search uh, index and search engine called Hoover. And we put on top of it um, uh, annotations. We are using hypothesis annotation um, that it's a protocol, I think, originally developed by the Open Knowledge Foundation, um, where you can um, interact directly with the documents by annotating them and leave a mark for the others who are coming to the same document. Uh, we are playing with integrating uh, robots to communicate when annotations are done into the chat so that we can uh, have an overview who's doing what and on what topic. And basically this is the idea of liquid investigations. We try to put all of that into a small box that we can give to, to the journalist and we are working on the communication protocols between the boxes so that we have uh, decentralized and almost peer-to-peer -peer, um, communication from small to bigger groups. And I'm drawing here, like we have several partners in this. Um, one of them, this is where, where I think the idea started, one of them is uh, uh, considering that technology, it's, it's politics by other mean, means. So we had that in mind when, when designing this, uh, this, uh, this project with the specific goal in mind to de democratize and make easier and uh, cheaper uh, the um, cross-border investigations groups. And I think, yes, we will test that and we are testing that and we are drawing from the experience I have in various networks uh, that I'm part of, That's including great. Ike. And but the, it, just closing. On that in a minute. Yeah, yeah, just so. closing it. <laughs> and I think this tool could be used also by others than just journalists in ad hoc investigations. Okay, thank Thanks. you. And, and finally, just for introduction, uh, back to Alison. Um, uh, I mean, we know you work with a lot of uh, local news teams. Um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about their, how they're incorporating investigative work into what they do. Sure. So I think the thing with um, local journalism, and I'm not saying that this is true in the industry, but certainly from an outside perspective, there is a general view that you don't get good quality investigative journalism in uh, local titles, and I, I think that's just such rubbish. Um, most of the really great stories that you see appearing on um, broadcast TV or actually in the nationals originated from uh, a local journalist knowing something and digging deeper in it. So I, I really think, you know, there is so much great work doing it, going on in our newsrooms. Um, and I work across kind of all of Trinity Mirror's regionals, um, so I kind of see some of the things that, that's going on and sometimes I get involved and help with it. There are some kind of fundamentals that we need in our, um, in our, in our journalism, uh, and that is if we're using tools, uh, we don't have massive budgets, so they've got to be cheap or, or free. 
and intuitive because people haven't got a lot of time to spend on these tools. They've got to be really helpful and useful and relevant, not just tools for the sake of it. So actually we do tend to use um, most of the free suite of tools that exist on the internet that anybody can kind of find, use and, and download or get into. Um, where we need to, we will build our own. We, we have an internal search and trends dashboard, for example, called Hive Alpha that, uh, that really helps our journalists dig into what the audience is kind of looking at on our sites or actually on external sites um, and how, the, how long they're interacting with it and the sort of stories that matter to them as well as social trends that they can pick up on and that's all in real time. So we, we do build tools but mostly we use others. Um, so some of the things that we use, if it's useful to touch on those, um, around so, sort of geo tools we will use a lot of the Google suite. So... Um, Google Earth and Street View, really important to us, especially around historic things. Um, looking at, for example, how an area has changed in Google Earth um, over the years. Uh, got a great story out of it around um, the shrinking of cultivated areas, for example, on, on a, a, <coughs> an area in the northwest that showed that green spaces that people were managing were actually in decline. And what that actually translated to was the complete collapse of the farming industry in that area. And you could see it from an aerial perspective in a way that perhaps the data wouldn't have told you. So actually, help, it helps people visualise. And then you can also make fly-throughs with Google Earth that let the reader see what you're doing. Uh, we use Street View a lot um, around our investigations, particularly around verification when we get kind of stories sent in to us. So that's, that's a really useful one. And other kind of geo tools that we use, obviously tweet deck searches, which people will be familiar with, with geo codes or, or advanced Twitter search. And we, we do use data miner, which I think is a, a paid for tool, but that's excellent around breaking news. And some of the other things that we use are um, Google Trends, uh, historic, obviously, and can show uh, how a mood. Uh, or a search pattern has changed over the years. We use that a great deal, and particularly now it's come down to a more granular level. It's more useful to our regional newsrooms. Um, and on survey, we do a lot on surveys, um, and they are particularly brilliant at, ask, at getting the readers involved in your investigations. So we might use Google surveys, or we might use SurveyMonkey. Um, but that whole kind of putting your journalism out there and asking the reader to get involved in an idea that you've had so you can investigate it with their help it is uh, really empowering and brings the brand closer to the audience as well. Um, we've just done one in Manchester around kind of life, living, health, mental health, all sorts of things, and I think there were over 5,000 responses on that from local people who wanted to talk about their experiences in the Manchester Evening News in that area will dig deeper now with those people's kind of buy-in in, into the issues that matter to them. Uh, in Wales, we asked readers um, about a particularly dangerous stretch of road, help us investigate some of the accidents that have happened there, help us investigate how we could solve those problems and how they'd be funded. And they actually, the answers that people came back with were so um, comprehensive and interesting um, that the Welsh Government took that as a document and is working from it now to try and implement some of the changes. So it was actually investigative journalism at a local level that affected change. Um, and finally, uh, just a quick one. We've got Google DNI funding for an Internet of Things connected news initiative. But as part of that, I've been working with guys who uh, work in uh, maker communities. And from that, we're now looking at doing investigations with drones and sensor journalism. So you might not have the expertise in your newsrooms, but there are people in your communities who will do. And uh, I would say if you can... You know, connect with universities, with their innovation labs, and, and just start thinking about how wearables and nearables, the sensors that you can put in the world and that will collect data around, whether that's kind of particulate data for pollution or movement data around kind of urban traffic, that sort of thing, I think, is going to become more and more important to our journalism. I'm really interested in doing a pollution um, investigation around schools. Everybody knows that People dropping kids off at schools clog up roads, and that's a nuisance. But it doesn't seem to stop anybody from doing it. I suspect if we can do a sensor and particular um, investigation around traffic and 
uh, pollution, we will be able to tell parents that they're damaging their children's health by doing that. So that's kind of the next step that we're looking at. So I have a quick question for you all and ask you for a quick answer before opening to the audience. But you are talking here about connecting people and um, we can see that more and more investigative efforts are collaborative. If you look at the Panama paper or other, the more it goes, the more it's collaboration between newsroom, between network of journalists. It's all across Europe. Do you think that would have been possible without technology and how technology can help this kind of uh, effort? <clears throat> that was a leading question. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be possible. I mean, like... Most of the meetings we do are online. We can't meet in person. We run different uh, relationships with different uh, people from different countries. For example, I'm, when there was the, the, the case of the Panama Papers, I was running a group of Cuban journalists, and really I, I can't be in Cuba just to coordinate them. It happened online mostly. I think that it's yeah, a leading question. Uh, I think <laughs> depending on the on the scale of it, yeah, we we would do uh, investigative projects with five six people in 2000, let's say, where we wouldn't use any tools. Basically, we would only uh, meet from time to time in a smaller region. So, depending on the scale you you want to do and you want to obtain, basically, I think that's where communication uh, communication tools intervene, and of course you need uh, this kind of stuff, unless you work for a huge, wealthy news organization and you can really travel around with a lot of people. I think it, it definitely speeds up the process and opens up the process. I would, I would say that um, it, it makes us more aware of some of the things that we can do, but I also think that there was great journalism, amazing journalism being done before the internet, and, and I think you know, if somebody pulled the plug tomorrow on the internet, journalists would still go and ask questions and find out great stories. So, I th yeah, I'm going to be slightly urgent provocateur and say yes, but only in the way that a laptop makes it easier for me to write a story than a, than a pen and paper and, and then distribute it. Okay, so um, as you've heard, there's a real breadth of experience here and expertise from different parts of Europe. Um, do we have any questions for our panel, please? Any questions at all? Yes, we've got one in the middle there. Um, can I just ask, if you ask a question, would you mind letting us know who you are and who the question's aimed at? Uh, my name's Liz Enox. I'm on the board of a... Uh, I'm on the board of a nonprofit investigative journalism organization in the United States, the San Francisco Public Press. So my question is for the DNI. What are you doing in the U.S.? <laughs> so, again, the DNI, it's not just a fund. Uh, it's an initiative that is a, today a European initiative. And it's built upon those three pillars. So the one is product, and part of the products are global. Uh, among the products, we have, for example, AMP Accelerated Mobile Pages, and that is not just in Europe. Uh, the fund is today open only in European Union and IFTA. So if you want to apply, you need to have a legal entity that is established in one of the 32 <coughs> European countries. But it works in partnership, right? <coughs> Say again? Work, it will work in partnership, basically, in partnership with the European structure. What do you mean? Partnership. There's, there's a partnership between a European... Oh, that, that, you, that you can collaborate yeah. with other parties, but the, yeah, yeah. the applicant should be established in yeah. Europe and Union of yeah. IFTA. That's it. I think we yeah. have a question down yeah. here. I already have the mic, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, my my question, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm Georg Dahm from the uh, German media startup, Fair Better Media, and um, we deal a lot with trying to, to get journalists or freelancers to collaborate with us, so my question is directed at Pavla. Um, we, I've, I'm an advocate for, for email encryption as well, and um, 
a lot of people are trying to convince find uh, the whole Thunderbird solution an extreme pain in the ass. So and I'm, I'm really frustrated with the, with the state of technological development when it comes to the usability of encrypted email. So I'm, I'm wondering, is really uh, Thunderbird the only way to go? There have been some um, startups like the Swiss, um, Swiss offering Proton Mail. Everybody claims uh, we, will, we will find a simpler way to enable people like journalists to send encrypted email, but it never seems to take hold. So, and I'm thinking a lot of journalists don't even care about encrypted communication anymore. They love Slack, they love the email, and, and they don't give a shit about encryption. So I was wondering if you have some thoughts on that. I believe Slack is encrypted, but I'm not sure about it. And you can use Mailvelope, what most of my colleagues are doing, but still I find uh, old school Thunderbird with PGP encryption uh, most convenient for me. And I am not really a techie person, you know. I've learned it because I needed to, and I set it up because I needed to, because uh, in this case it's it's better to stay safe than to be a sorry. And it's not only about you; it's also about your partners. You can expose by um, sending unencrypted emails. So yeah, uh, just force your colleagues, and that's it. <laughs> Use, it, use some violence. I, will, I would add to this. Uh, so we, we have about 100 people working now in um, EIC, and they all have to have uh, PGP encryption because they would get uh, invites to enter different systems that we use for communication. So basically we use these two steps. One is the email encrypted uh, to get into the different uh, system that it's secured, so then they don't have to deal with this encryption then on a daily basis. Because I really find like in big groups, PGP emails is just <laughs> unusable. I mean, people respond and by mistake they don't encrypt anymore, so they can they expose the whole thread communication. Well, it happens so often that I really, like, <laughs> you, you are right in a way, but also I find that with this 100 people and it's it's been very fast the process. If they want to get into the, the data, if they are interested to look at some data, they do take the effort to uh, set up a PGP key and reply to you in, uh, encrypted, at least for that moment when you push them to a different communication system that is more secure. I have a question. At the Hello, front. Mario Tereskinilale, the Offshore Journalism uh, Toolkit Project, which, by the way, happens to be funded by the ANI. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, Actually, you're, of course, talking about tools for uh, reporting on investigative projects. We are more working on the published part of the equation. Uh, we uh, kind of think that there are lots of material that's being published, even not so very important investigative pr uh, projects that are being uh, uh, threatened with uh, deletion for any uh, possible reasons, uh, especially in Europe. And so we are studying in, uh, we are in, uh, uh, whether we can, like big companies, uh, jockey around uh, different jurisdictions to uh, minimize their fiscal contribution, whether we can maximize our freedom of speech uh, by doing just the same. That's why we call it the Offshore Journalism Project. And I think it's not exactly your uh, uh, turf right now in this panel, but it, it's germane to it. And I thought it, it might be interested uh, to know. It's just journalism, uh, offshorejournalism.com. Thank you. Uh, we have a question in the middle. Hi, my name is Lindsay Sample. I work for a Vancouver-based company called Discourse Media. So we do long-form investigative and in-depth reporting. Um, I'm really curious because you guys mentioned a lot of tools that you use, and I'm just curious, um, because there's so many people here that might want to try different things that are out there, are there any tools that you've used that totally suck, that you would not recommend anyone ever try? Emails. <laughs> and maybe if, if you can just explain some of, the, some of the sort of red flags or things to watch out for. Good question. Take that, anyone? Okay. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, Sometimes you think they're good, and then uh, and then technology and the world changes, and they turn out to be rubbish or they suck. As you, so we used to use Tableau a lot for kind of visualization and um, kind of information around that, and uh, it's not great on mobile. So that was one that we we would have. You know, if I'd been talking to you three four years ago, I'd been like, yeah, that's a really great tool, and, and now don't. Equally. Um, we don't do much with Google Maps because you get stuck in them on mobile. And, uh, and so that's something that we, we tend not to, 
do an awful lot with as, as a tool. That's just a couple. I wouldn't bash any tool. I mean, any tool, it's just um, uh, a way to, you, you try it as a user, you use it in different ways. So if it sucks, it's maybe your fault. Um, but you should, I think you should also inform yourself what the tool does and what it doesn't, uh, and also what it does in terms of data. Uh, for you as a user, if it keeps data, how the data is stored, where they are going to, and so on. And this is not only for the big, like, big uh, tools and platforms, but also for the smaller ones that you are offered when you enter in a collaboration. And then I would say one that really sucks, but in a nice way that I uh, enjoy uh, watching are uh, email <laughs> lists that people uh, use by mistake to respond all instead of responding to one person. So then you can see uh, a bit more of uh, what that person really thinks about stuff. Um, but that, that would be one ancient tool that is still in use, I guess, by a lot of uh, people. Okay, any other questions from the floor? So? No, that's great. I have uh, one last question I, I wanted to ask, actually. I, I was talking to Pavla before this session, and it struck me, as uh, I said before, that there's a lot of non-profits working in this sort of space, and I was wondering how, how eager, how amenable um, mainstream news organizations are uh, to actually take the resulting investigations that these guys are all busy doing. Um, so I'm going to ask that question again to Pavla, um, so you can also hear. Yeah, uh, actually, as in a uh, in big part of the Europe, the situation of the media ownership changed in the last three years. And we are talking about some kind of oligarchization of the media. Uh, in, uh, we've got our own Berlusconi in Czech Republic. It's actually a guy, the most powerful politician these days. At the same time, he's leading the, the most powerful political party. He runs the biggest Czech business, and at the same time, he owns the biggest media house. Uh, so, as a kind of um, response to this, a lot of small media initiatives emerged. And actually, uh, 12 of a Czech businessmen decided they are going to throw some money to support such a independent media initiatives. And they created a fund for independent journalism in Czech Republic. It's like very recent. Um, they started uh, to give the first grants just in December 2016. Uh, they funded us, but what I want to tell is that, you know, we as an investigative journalist, we are not lost because there most probably always be people who actually appreciate what we are doing. So just make some push, push on your business people to give some money and uh, to create a fund to support their own independent media. Otherwise, they, they would know what is the hidden agenda of the media who can afford to to pay a normal journalist, regular journalist. I would add to this because uh, I'm working for a year and a bit with uh, this European network that involves um, a lot of uh, existing media, but it's new players and old players, uh, big players and small players around Europe. And I've seen that um, there is an interest. It only depends how uh, fast you, you start to discuss your idea um, before it develops into a story, into an investigation. If you come and hit them with a, a ready story, that's not going to uh, work well. If you develop the story together or the investigation together, that works really well. And second, on these uh, new tools and uh, uh, development of new tools, I was also surprised to see that uh, most of these big media organizations don't have uh, internal uh, tools like this developed. But... Uh, I, I understand the reason, because they have a daily operation ongoing, so they cannot put resources from the, from the tech resources they have into developing and experimenting with new tools. So that's where I think we do play with new technology in Ike, uh, with some of the people from this media. They are really eager to, to do stuff. It's just a matter of resources and money. We've talked here a lot about tools to help doing investigative effort. Uh, technology also empowers the readers. Uh, I would like to talk a bit about the follow-up of the investigative effort and how technology and user engagement can change, reshape 
the way you are engaging the conversation with the readers after the investigative effort. Do you want them to? Yeah, listen. Okay. So um, we have a, a small data unit that covers the whole of the regionals, and, and there are a couple of journalists in that, and a developer and a coder, and basically they they constantly kind of look for publicly available data, clean it, um, make it accessible. Our journalists will use it, and that, that data is generally always put out into the world for other people to use. Um, and if they've built something around that, the code with it is always on GitHub for other people to use as well. So actually, if you search GitHub for Trinity Mirror Data Unit, you'll probably find tools that we've built for us that, that you can also use. Um, but where it, I think it becomes really interesting is... Um, once you've put the data out there, you've put the information out there, the feedback that comes in, whether that's on Facebook comments or um, from people taking it, using it, changing it in some way, or actually just people phoning the reporter back to talk about it. And you can see stories evolve all the time because of that. And the other interesting thing is if you, if you do your investigation in the wild as it progresses, I think that getting people involved in it, whether that's kind of in a, a Facebook group or um, in a, in a you know, crowdsourced way, you, it, it will always change the, the end point of the story that you think you're working towards and make it better. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think that collaboration is really important for us. I mean, I guess you guys are dealing on with kind of some very, very sensitive and important kind of dangerous data which may not be worth putting out like that but certainly at our level it, you know, the things that we look into we try and involve people okay. do, you, do you have anything extra to add on that sort of crowdsourcing element that might be helpful it's probably it's slightly distant but yeah no okay I, 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 I would say I have seen different projects using or releasing data I really, I really think it's great but it's a long term thing and it's uh, building up an archive people will use it. It's, I didn't see any impressive uh, result of crowd uh, sourcing. People digging and running. You know about a, a few very well-known projects, but if you go in and, and talk to the people who organize them, you will know that there is a lot of effort to do that and it doesn't really pay off in the end. Okay. Well, but it's a crowd, uh, uh, crowd so, uh, sourcing project. It's Wikipedia, so that's where people... So I think we've got to the end of the panel, unless there's any last-minute questions. But thank you all very much for coming. Um, I know everybody here uh, has enjoyed it and will be available for any other questions you have. Thank you. Very qualitative and much more collaborative project and collaborative effort, and especially uh, for investigation. What we've tried to do is to organize through clusters the type of project we received. And that's very complicated because innovation is by default something new. And no one tried to really organize uh, all the type of projects. So we created some kind of clusters. One is intelligence, data and management and workflow interface and discovery, social and community, somehow about business model, distribution and circulation. Um, and the two more, I would say, trending category, the one we receive uh, the, m most of the project is about intelligence. It goes to audience development, semantic, analytics. The other one is next journalism. Next journalism is very big and broad. It goes from fact-checking to gamification, that data journalism, robot journalism, audio development, and a uh, new format. Um, and uh, one of these, of course, is investigation. And this is where I, oh, sorry. <laughs> Aim of the fund is, again, stimulate the news ecosystem. We've made available 150 million euros over three years for projects that demonstrate new thinking in the practice of digital journalism or that support the development of new business model. Everyone that have idea for news can apply to the fund. The fund is very broad and open. 32 European countries are eligible to apply. And it's open to start-up, individuals, journalists, broadcaster, legacy media. That's very broad and open. It's about having ideas, having projects, be specific, be in depth, and trying to tackle big challenges 
the news ecosystem is facing, and investigation is one of those. So we are very glad that you're going to talk more about your project. Very briefly, we have three tracks. One is for big ideas that have assumptions to be tested is the prototype track, up to 50K, and we found 100% of, um, uh, of the amount of funding requested, again, up to 50K. And then we have medium and large project, up to 1 million euro funding. Hello, thank you all for coming. This is a session on <laughs> investigative journalism, how technology has empowered it, which um, is uh, hosted by the Google DNI Fund. Um, just to introduce everybody that is here on this panel, if I start uh, on my far left, uh, we have um, Alison Gao, who is from the UK and is the innovation editor for Trinity Mirror, which is the UK's largest newspaper group, and obviously more than newspapers these days. Um, then we have uh, Stefan Candia, who is the founder of the European Investigative Collaborations Organisations. I have Pavla next to me, who is from the Centre for Investigative Journalism in the Czech Republic. And to my right, my colleague on the DNI Fund, Ludovic Blischer, who um, prior to, to that was also the digital champion at La Liberation and uh, a fellow at the uh, Newman. So we're going to kick off this morning, if it's okay with you, with uh, a brief introduction about uh, the DNI fund and the investigative reporting things that we are funding through that scheme that aren't in the room. And then we're going to uh, go to each of our panelists. And medium and large are open only to company with at least one journalist on staff. Prototype is open to everyone. Um, we get in 2016 to 2,300 yeah. uh, 2, <laughs> yeah. applications coming from 30 European countries. At the end of the day, we selected last year 250 projects for 51 million euros across 25, uh, 27 European countries. So there is a lot of traction. We receive a lot of projects. We're having a lot of interaction and discussion with publishers. And at the end of the day, we always make a very tough, earth-breaking uh, decision. So it's important if you want to apply to have in mind that the application process in itself is an opportunity to step back, build your vision, brainstorm with your team, and have a project that you are proud of. <coughs> Difference between uh, the two rounds we had last year was in terms of quality. First round, we had a lot of projects, a bit less on round two, but much more that were I quite a very list, and they're going to tell us a little bit about the work they do in this field. And then, obviously, we want to very much open this up to, to you, um, take all your questions. Um, so, please, uh, let's, let's get going. So, I'll hand you over to Ludo. Okay, so br very briefly, I'm going to introduce the DNA Innovation Fund because I think it's important to give you a glimpse of what we are doing with the fund. Uh, do you all know what is the Digital News Initiative and the DNA Innovation Fund or not? Okay, so let's assume you know. But uh, the, the DNA Innovation Fund is part of a broader initiative, broad um, upon three, built upon three pillars. The one is product. The other one is research and training, and the third one is innovation. Innovation is all about stimulation. And this digital news initiative is Google framework for dialogue with the news ecosystem. Through the innovation pillar, what we are trying to do is to help the news ecosystem to test new ideas, to their taking risk, and to come with project about innovation. It's not about modernization, it's really about innovation and stimulation.